pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Our second reading today also comes from the Hebrew scriptures. It comes from 2 Kings and is the very tail end of the long story of Elijah, probably the most important prophet in the history of Israel. He didn't leave behind a book like Isaiah or Micah or Amos, but the stories that are told about Elijah are so stupendous and so important that later in the New Testament, we see all of prophecy symbolized by Elijah, even as the whole of the law is symbolized by Moses. So here we have the tail end of the story of Elijah. And I should note the second prophet in the story today, confusingly, is named Elisha. So keep those straight in your head. Elijah, the older of the prophets, Elisha, the younger of the prophets. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets went with them and stood at some distance from them as they were both standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry land. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. Elijah responded, You've asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. And when Elisha could no longer see Elijah, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water saying, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? When he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. Please pray with me. My words spoken and words heard and the spaces in between prompt us to consider carefully. Amen.
Over the 42 years I've served as a parish pastor, I have had to bid congregations I have pastored adieu. Each time the farewell has been marked by a special worship service, often attended by parishioners, denominational officials, family members, and colleagues in ministry. There's been some sort of meal or reception following the service and lovely gifts. I treasure the memory of those times of celebration, though they were marked with tears of both joy and sorrow. Gratitude for the time that we'd had as pastor and people, but also sadness about leaving, knowing that some of the people I said goodbye to, I would never see again. That was never more dramatic for me than September of 2001, when on Sunday the 9th, we officially marked the end of the 10-year tenure I had at a church in New Jersey. And then two, year, two days later, one of the parishioners I had hugged goodbye on the 9th was killed in the attack on the World Trade Center. Sometimes goodbye is really goodbye. In saying goodbye, you also realize things will never be the same. For in our denomination, when a pastor leaves, she or he is supposed to really leave. Unless specifically invited by one's successor to participate in a church function, the departing pastor is not supposed to do weddings or funerals or baptism or pastoral care or whatever. In fact, the United Church of Christ's Ministerial Code of Ethics states that ordained pastors will, and I quote, neither interfere with nor intrude upon the ministry of their successor upon departure from a ministry setting. That is a code that every ordained pastor in the United Church of Christ must subscribe to. An aside, I have been blessed here with a wonderful predecessor who has abided by that code even though he lives right here on Sanibel. And it's been my delight to have him participate in our life together in a variety of ways. Trust me though when I say this, it doesn't always work out that way. And I've known more than one colleague in ministry whose life has been disrupted and their ministry even destroyed by an interfering predecessor. Of course, one of the challenges of saying goodbye in our system, where the lag time between the settled permanent pastors can be as long as two years, is that the departing pastor does not know who the successor will be. And in some instances, the two never meet, which calls for a great deal of trust. Trust that the work one has done with a congregation won't be undone by the pastor who next occupies the pulpit. It was different, though, for Elijah, Arguably, he was the most powerful prophet Israel had ever known. His time in office had been marked by many highs and incredible lows. He called out the corrupt rulers of the nation, King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, and he'd taken on their priests and prophets who were infiltrating Israel's religious life, seeking to turn the Israelites to the worship of Baal. Between Ahab, Jezebel, and those priests from afar, there truly was collusion. At one point, Elijah challenges those priests to a duel, a duel for the ages, as he builds an altar for Yahweh, the God of Israel, and they build an altar to Baal. Each places a sacrificial bull on the altar. 
Call on your gods, Elijah shouts, and I will call on mine. Whoever's God answers with fire and burns up the sacrifice, that God will be proven the most powerful. The prophets of Baal chant and pray and even cut themselves to draw the attention of Baal. They dance around the altar, they scream, they beg, all to no avail. Nothing happens. Nada. Elijah, somewhat of a wise guy, adds another layer of difficulty to the task by dousing his altar with bucket after bucket after bucket of water. And then he simply prays. No shouts, no dance, no self-mutilation. O oh Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, let it be known that you are the God of Israel and that I am your servant. And right then and there, fire falls from heaven and consumes the whole enchilada. Sacrificial bull, wood, stones, water, everything gone, up in smoke. Elijah has won. God has won. More challenges lie ahead. More encounters with the king and queen and their flunkies. Eventually, it all leads to Elijah's face showing up on wanted posters at the Jerusalem post office. And so he needs to flee for his very life, which he does. He's a prophet on the lamb, ending up at Mount Horeb, where he encounters God in that famous still, small voice. There's so much more to his story, but shortly after that episode, he meets Elisha, who becomes his protege. And together they travel throughout the country, continuing to make trouble for the royal family and their stooges. Long story short, there's a pretty gruesome prediction about the fate that will befall Queen Jezebel. King Ahab eventually dies, but his successor, King Ahaziah, is no better. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, reads the record, and walked in the way of his mother and father. The corruption, the greed, the lack of justice continues. Elijah's work was far from over. Eventually, Ahaziah dies, but his successor is no better yet. And so, still more work to be done by the prophet. But he's getting on in years, and no doubt worn down. He's tired and ready to meet his maker, ready to hang up his prophet's staff and pass on the mantle. All along, through the 20 or so years of battling the successors of Ahab and Jezebel, he's had a companion, an associate, an assistant at his side. Remember? Elisha. So Elijah knows that the work will continue. He's trained up his successor well. Elijah himself, though, he just wants to slip away quietly. No farewell party, no, no big reception with gifts and keepsakes. He doesn't want a gold watch that says, thanks, Elijah, for all your years of service. He doesn't want a purse for a well-funded, much-needed vacation cruise on the Mediterranean. He just wants to say goodbye and be done with it. So he tells Elisha that he's going to head off and that Elisha should stay behind. But the younger man will have none of it. So he follows his mentor. Despite the warnings he's given by others, he's going to die, you know. God's going to take him up to heaven. Bah, pipe down says Elisha. I just want to spend a bit more time with him. Learn what I can from him while I can. So they go on their way. The whole thing happens over again at their first stop, Bethel. Again, Elijah urges Elisha to stay behind. No, he insists, I will not leave you. 
So on they go to Jericho. Again, the same. Again, the refusal to stay behind. Finally, they end up at the Jordan River. Elijah takes off his mantle, his, his outer garment, rolls it up, and reminiscent of Moses at the Red Sea, he strikes the water and the river parts. The two prophets cross over to the other side. This is it, says Elijah. This really is as far as you can go. So tell me, Elisha, before I do, what can I do for you? What can I do for you before I leave? The younger man is no dummy. He's observed that everything Elijah has done has been a result of his close connection to the Holy One. Give me a double share of your spirit, he says. Elijah knows it's not his to give. God alone can grant such a wish. But still, listen, Elijah says, if you see me when I leave, understand that to be a sign from God that your wish has been granted. If you don't see me depart, well, sorry, Elisha, no parting gift today. And then, then in one of the least noticed, but I would argue most important lines in the story, we read these six words. As they continued walking and talking, as they continued walking and talking, what were they talking about? Was Elijah giving the younger man a few parting bits of advice? Was he reminding him of the work yet to be done? Was he telling him to remember the widows, to champion the orphans and the unaccompanied minors, to not be impressed by the 1%, by things like titles and wealth? Or maybe, maybe it was just one of those, you know, superficial conversations you have in the car when you're taking someone to the airport, you know, delaying the whole goodbye thing. You know, did you remember to pack everything? I hope it's a good flight. What about those Red Sox? We don't know. We'd love to know. But whatever the case, as they're walking and talking, suddenly a flaming chariot descends from the heavens with horses of fire and a virtual whirlwind catches up Elijah into the conflagration and whisks him away into the heavens. And Elisha sees the whole thing, every wisp of smoke, every spark, every flame. He calls out a final goodbye, Father, Father! In grief, he rends his own garment, tears it in two, and then he picks up Elijah's mantle from the ground, for it has been passed. And in the years ahead, he does indeed prove to have received double the spirit of Elijah as he engages in powerful ministries of healing, justice, Joy. Elijah did know who his successor would be, and he took the time to make sure he was ready. I'm not planning on leaving here anytime soon. But I am increasingly aware of the fact that one day I will retire. One day I will be saying farewell. I imagine we will all find an appropriate way to mark that occasion. 
but I, I know it won't be anything like that scene at the Jordan River. <laughs> no chariots of fire for me. And unlike Elijah, I more than likely will not know who my successor will be. Not at all. Nor when we say goodbye, will you. So there is no protege for you and me to nurture and train. Still, that doesn't mean we can't be prepared. That doesn't mean we can't pave the way for those who will follow. Those who will follow me, and quite frankly, those who will follow you in the pews. Which, of course, in a very real way, is what we are doing every day. Not just here at church, but in every aspect of our lives. What we say and what we do, how we say it, how we do it, is setting a course for those who come after us. Today literally marks the very last day of my tenure as president of the Rotary Club here on the island. I've had the privilege of working alongside my successor and know that he is well prepared, largely due to his own persistence, much like Elisha on the final journey that he took with Elijah. Last Tuesday, I conducted my final meeting as president of our board of directors, and Friday, my last club meeting in that role. We've said our formal goodbyes. I even have a lovely plaque to prove it. One of these days, I'll get around to hanging it up in my office. And a gift certificate from one of my favorite restaurants. The next time I attend either of those meetings, the board of directors meeting or the club meeting, I will be like a former pastor, except for I will be allowed to be there. I trust that I will use those experiences of being the past president, the immediate past president, and not the current president, as a training ground a training ground for what lies ahead professionally here. Not tomorrow, not next season, but sometime in the future that draws closer all the time. Meanwhile, though, there is work to be done, ministry to be undertaken. There is a course to continue setting and a foundation to continue building up. Might you and I be blessed with a double share of God's spirit as we set about that work here and now.